So it is a great pleasure to, to open this session. We're going to do this on a sort of a two-step way so that we can allow Minister uh, Susana Malcorra to leave uh, back to, to her duties uh, at the WTO uh, ministerial. We're in very, uh, really uh, thankful for, for uh, Minister Malcorra to have made the effort to be with us when we know that precisely right now, before the heads of delegation meeting at 2 o'clock, as I understand, uh, we're going through very uh, interesting but difficult uh, discussions at the Hilton. So thank you very much for being with us. I won't take uh, long to just introduce uh, the, the plenary. Uh, we're here to talk about the future of the global trade system and the WTO, and those titles were not uh, sort of uh, carelessly uh, crafted. Uh, so this is what we want to talk about, how the global trade system includes the WTO, but it's not all about the WTO. And particularly, we wanted to have the opportunity to provide Minister Marcorra with a platform at this Trade and Sustainable Development Symposium to talk about the connection between uh, trade policy, trade and investment policy and frameworks, I should say, and those larger uh, public policy goals that are enshrined in Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, which is something very close to ICTSD, of course, uh, and to reflect on the work that is happening at the ministerial. So I'll give the floor to Minister Malcorra to make her remarks. She would have to leave early, but she will stay with us for about half an hour. Once she's done with her remarks, then we will move on to uh, the panel. And for that, we have Sumaya Keynes, uh, who's going to moderate the panel. And Sumaya, I was using a very colloquial way of describing her, but she's really one of the top experts as a journalist in the world on trade issues. And so the um, way I was using to describe her uh, would put the emphasis on the enthusiasm that she has for understanding all trade issues, really, and all about trade and what underpins the discussions on trade. And we're really very thankful for Sumaya to be with us. Uh, I did mention that you're with The Economist, uh, which is a well-known uh, media uh, in this field. Uh, then we would have uh, Tony Estivayordal. Uh, I just have the, my list here, so allow me if I go that way. And Tony is our partner in this um, uh, whole symposium, and he's the head of integration and trade at the Inter-American Development Bank, and has been really a, an intellectual force, because that's what he's been. It's not a regular uh, bank operation. It's really an intellectual force, particularly in the, in the, in the person of Tony, uh, to really understand the nitty-gritty of uh, integration uh, through trade and investment. We have uh, Susanna Heidelin, who is the State Secretary for Trade of uh, Denmark. And again, Denmark is a, is a big uh, uh, original partner of ICTSD since 1996, and so we're very pleased to have you with us, uh, in, in particularly in this session, because of, again, Denmark's perspectives on the, on the issues. Uh, so I think we're going to have Isabel Durand, who is uh, the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD. I was just saying that we were waiting for, for Mr. Kinturi, so apologies for that. We're very happy to have Isabel with us. Again, Isabel is from Belgium, a uh, political figure in her own right, newly to, uh, to UNCTAD as Deputy Secretary General. Uh, then Arancha Gonzalez, who's known to all of you here, uh, one of the most prolific, prolific speakers on international trade, executive director of the International Trade Center, and formerly uh, with the WTO, um, a right-hand person to former uh, DG of the WTO, Pascal Lamy. We also have Rufus Jerksa, and uh, Rufus who is a and, uh, colleague of many years, not to say an old friend, uh, is president of the National Foreign Trade Council in Washington, the main industry association working on trade, uh, and formerly an ambassador, uh, USCR, deputy USCR, representing his country in Geneva, uh, but also with several other functions and long experience as an international trade uh, law practitioner. So with that, I'll just turn now to Minister Malcorra, and then we go on with, uh, with Somaya and the panels. Thank you all very much. Gracias, Ricardo. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to have a conversation 
on issues that matter so much to us that are of a longer term perspective and that sometimes we, we sort of miss in our deliberations. But before that, let me, before going into the matter itself, let me um, welcome you all to Buenos Aires. I hope that we are treating you well. Um, it's not easy to, to have as many people as we are having here. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated logistical challenge, as you well know. Uh, but I know that my colleagues, uh, this has been a, a broad interministerial uh, endeavor uh, that started at the beginning of the year. I think they have done an, an amazing job trying to accommodate to the best possible way all our guests. And um, we work hard on the weather also. And I think the weather is, that part has come so far so good. So particularly for the ones that come from the north and I follow the Weather Channel uh, with some uh, challenging times weather-wise, not the rest. Um, I, I think that makes a, a big difference to, to being here in Buenos Aires and, and not to have the real hot Buenos Aires and not the real humid Buenos Aires. So again, uh, thanks for being here and, and, and enjoy Buenos Aires to the extent possible. Let me go into, into the question that was posed for us to discuss. And I tell you that um, the one thing that I have found in my, my endeavors in, in Geneva these past few months as, as the, the chair of the, of the conference is that I, I was surprised to see the level of distance that there is between certain issues that are discussed in other platforms in the multilateral system and what is discussed in Geneva. That came to me as a real surprise. And this is more so because some of you may know, I was deeply engaged in the deliberations that members had to arrive to the agreement of the 2030 agenda, which I took, I think mistakenly, as a commitment that we as governments have taken broadly, that we have embraced broadly, and that we have aligned all our work and, and, and policy thinking to that 2030 agenda. I arrived to Geneva and I realized that that was not necessarily the case when we were talking trade in Geneva. So that, that came as a surprise. <laughs> And I, I think that's one of the drivers I have when I talk about the issues we have at hand here. And I will talk briefly about what is happening in the Hilton. Don't worry, I'll, I'll get to that. I know that's the only thing you care about at this point in time. Um, so, you know, for me, one of the big challenges we have before us is how to include in our WTO, in this institution that all of us feel is so fundamental, so important for trade, that has helped us uh, set the basis for a regulatory environment that allows us to, to move in the trade arena not as being in the jungle, but having something that we abide by, that we are committed to do, that if we don't do it, we have the, 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 the tools to present our case and to be assessed in a, in a very balanced manner, that no matter how big, how small, how powerful and not, or not powerful you are, you have your chances on equal footing, that fundamental institution somehow lacks the capacity to have dialogues at the policy level. And it is so very interesting that this is something that we, we, we see. So much so, let me tell you something about starting to connect with the conference. We had yesterday, for the first time in the history of these conferences, time dedicated for the ministers to have a dialogue. 
an unscripted dialogue. I couldn't believe it. When I proposed that we will have this time set aside, there was a reaction that, well, you know, we don't do these things, it has never been done. My answer was, well, probably this is a good opportunity to start doing it because we are where we are because we don't talk these things. So, you know, it, it, how do we lift this so critical institution to the level that is needed? And how do we have the space to discuss matters that don't necessarily will become negotiating subjects in our agenda. And I bring this to you because for me, that's exactly the reason why there is a disconnect between what we do and how we do it in Geneva and what has happened in New York with the 20th 30 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals and what has happened in Paris and the Paris Agreement, how do we integrate these matters? How do we do it? First, not to reinvent the wheel, and second, to update the views and the agendas that we have in Geneva to the latest thinking that we also were able to, to create in our deliberations somewhere else, particularly in New York. And I don't have yet an answer, but what I tell you is that I've been posing this question to everybody. And um, I think one of the uh, deliverables we should achieve somewhere, I don't know whether it's going to be in Buenos Aires, is to establish that uh, mechanism establish that principle, establish that vehicle, whatever you want to call it. I don't want to create a new institutional arrangement, but the vehicle to have these higher level conversations and to connect those higher level conversations with the specifics of each institution for the matter of a discussion, WTO is the one we are referring to. How do we connect this with the other institutions that are also in Geneva to make it more, more conducive. And it was very interesting in this uh, conversation we had yesterday among the ministers, there were some who said, well, that's not within the mandate of WTO. WTO is mandated, has four mandates, and the mandates were repeated, but essentially to have negotiations and to then regulate and, of course, a, a make sure that there is an oversight on the compliance of those, of those negotiations and those norms. Not being able to have a step before that that secures that our negotiations somehow are a la par with the things we are setting as our broader agenda, I think is a missing link in what we have. And in particular, this is true with the somehow confrontation, I wouldn't, maybe confrontation is, is a harsh way to put it, the, the different views that come from whether WTO has or has not fulfilled the mandate of the DDA, of the Doha Development Agenda, and how that connects to the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. Because Doha took place many years ago. In fact, it took place when we were starting to work on the MDGs. The MDGs have passed, and now we have a new collective view, share view, of how to move forward uh, where it is a universal agenda, it applies to everybody, not to the North instructing the South, it's for all of us. It talks about being people and planet centric. It talks about trade as one of the pillars of that development, but also makes the case for the interconnectivity of the different elements, and that's why we arrived to 17 goals. So I don't have an answer for this. So if you are waiting for me to tell you this is how we shall solve it, I do not know. 
What I do know is that unless we start to talk about this in Geneva, unless we start to make that connection at a political policy level in Geneva, and then we decide whether this becomes something that is worth eventually being a negotiated uh, agenda item, or we just think that this has an impact on, on a national policy, on, on taking best practices, whatever, unless we do that, this disconnect will continue. And let me associate this to what you are really interested to hear, which is what is happening in, in the Hilton. We have a long-standing divide in the house. And this is not something new. And I want to emphasize this, because somehow I, I, I've gotten the sense that we have these days certain scapegoats that allow us to say, well, this is the problem, because such and such have now uh, shift gears. It is not a fair description of reality. First, we have had the divide on where we stand on the Doha development agenda for some time, so much so that in the case of the Nairobi Declaration, we stated clearly that there was a divide. It is the first time that I personally have seen a, a document coming out of a multilateral setting that instead of saying we have agreed to this, says we have agreed to disagree on this. And maybe it's a first step, but it's, it's, there are not many examples of that. So we have had the, this difference on, on the question of development for some time. It is true that now is probably emphasized in a more clear manner, is articulated, articulated in, 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 in a more direct way, but we do have issues around the, the, the negotiating agenda for some time. And we have had uh, questions that have been intractable for long, long, many years. So how do we recognize this stagnation, this lack of progress? And we recognize it, so again, we lift it to another level of discussion and see whether we can have that conversation outside the negotiating table to assess what chances and how is it that the negotiations can move ahead. I think that's something that we owe it to ourselves. Of course, that cannot be done in the context of, of a conference. And now let me go to the point of the conference. I have created enough a, a, uh, questions already. Conference is going well. It's going well in the sense that we have been able to address all the issues. We have had a very, very um, engaging process. The one thing I hear from everybody, right, left, and center, is that in past conferences, things have not been uh, transparent enough. They have not been inclusive enough. I have taken upon myself to make sure that that inclusivity, that transparency is there. I have visited very many capitals and I have met with every single member state in groupings so I could hear everybody. That is the base from which I started uh, chairing this conference. And we did set a, a good open-ended groups to launch the conversations where they have been left with unfinished business from, from Geneva. Probably the disappointing aspect is that we go back to the same arguments that we have here in Geneva. So to a certain extent, it's a repetition of what has been said endless times in Geneva. So the exercise was good to engage everybody, but probably was not very conducive to gear it to results. Now we are narrowing and we are trying to make sure that we do have some specific outcomes uh, from this uh, conference. And here I would like to also uh, uh, repeat what I've been saying, which is a very simple phrase that I have coined, that there is life after Buenos Aires. 
As much as we have the weight of history and so many years where certain issues have not been finalized, I don't expect all of them to be finalized in Buenos Aires. And it will be unfair to ask for this conference to deliver what has not been able to deliver as an institution in the past 15 years. My sense is that we're going to move the agenda forward in certain issues. It's going to be a combination of maybe decisions on certain specific questions and decision on processes. And let me say, when I talk about there is life behind, after Buenos Aires, I refer to two things. One is that we have a forward agenda, and that's when, what I refer to processes that give a horizon of work for all of us, a predictability of work. And the second one is that there is an institution after Buenos Aires. And this second one is probably the most important deliverable that I hope to have out of this conference. So are we there yet? No, we are not. We are probably at the peak of the tensions. Uh, we are probably at the moment where everybody is in, in his or her corner trying to defend the view. I am guided by the principle that President Macri gave in his uh, uh, intervention, in his speech uh, at the opening on Sunday. And I don't know how many of you were there. He said that it is time to, yes, of course, uh, defend our national interest. No one could dare say no to that, but that we also need to weight the balance between our national interest and the public good and the global shared perspective of where is it that we need to go. So with this in mind, I'm confident that there will be life after Buenos Aires. Uh, it's, a, it's a good notion that when you all leave, and not that I want you to leave, on the contrary, you stay here, be tourists, and spend some, some time in enjoying Argentina. But when you all leave, we will have some horizon of work uh, regarding some of the issues that are pending. Hopefully, we will have something on some of the issues of the 21st century. And of course, there is a divide here again, but the discussion is ongoing. And also, hopefully, we will be able to recognize the need to set the course for a dialogue at the highest level on trade issues relating to development that talk about sustainability long term, that connect to the remaining efforts in the system at large, but also that allow us to think policy in terms of not only talking about what is the comma here or there in the negotiating process. I tend to be an optimist, otherwise I will not be doing what I'm doing, but I'm convinced that even though as everybody starts saying that a trade is at the crossroads, I really believe this is an opportunity to calibrate where we are and eventually adjust course to make sure that we bet on development that is sustainable, where trade is a part, not the only part, and that we recognize the interconnectivity with many other things that we all have to do and we all have to reflect in our national policies and in our national decisions. So with that in mind, and excusing myself for not being able to stay here, and I hope you understand that, I wish these panelists, which I know most of them, a, a, a great conversation, and a, I hope you wish all of us not good luck, because luck is, is not what we need, but good will. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yep, it is now. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, wow, okay, so I had prepared some comments, um, but I think that has blown them out of the water. We have a pretty good idea of the, of the deep challenges um, facing us. So I think, uh, you know, the, the question at hand is, is, are we ready for these big global challenges? And, and from what, I'm, what I just heard, what we all just heard from Susanna, it, it doesn't sound like we quite are. It sounds like there's maybe something wrong in the system. There are these philosophical differences in the approach to development. Um, and so what I'd love to get from the panel is 
you know, your ideas of specific things that we need to change. What do we need to change? Who needs to change? Who needs to step up and change their approach? Who needs to be giving more goodwill, as it were? And everyone's, everyone's thinking about that, hopefully. And uh, so I'm going to start with um, Minister Susanna. Um, and so, so for you, my question is, you know, what role does the EU have uh, in terms of leading this? Is there anything that needs to change? Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the role of EU. I think um, when the EU looks at at the, the WTO and looks at the global trade. Um, it has been so incremental in, in how we define ourselves and no uh, EU, which is only, uh, was truly based on the, the internal market and then the interest in having a, a common shared market and, 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 fair, and playing, a fair playing field. So what I think the EU voice is about here is uh, saying that we should not try to stop trade. Uh, it's an engine for growth, innovation, uh, lots of people out of poverty, but much more addressing the negative side effects, basically. And the side effects uh, are both on to be addressed in a multilateral setting and definitely on, on behalf of governments. And uh, European governments have taken it on themselves to do it very differently also. And I think that's also... Uh, part of the story that there are no one way to do it but 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 in my way there may be three uh, issues one is that you have to create jobs instead of just preserving jobs so creating jobs um, and to do that you have to have education system lifelong uh, training lifelong it, uh, uh, systems to adapt to to the economies the different economies and part of that is sort of uh, not protecting the jobs, but protecting the people in the work market, and and um, and thirdly, to to have a level playing field, and this is definitely where we need the WTO to come in and create that playing field, and so governments need to address both their internal sort of domestic markets, and then address through the WTO. And, and can I make a comment to the SDGs from 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 Ms. Malcora said? I think that would be very interesting to 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 include today as well. I mean. I think we have all, I mean, I have been surprised to see a little bit how quickly the SDG agenda has rolled over the world, into the world. We see our businesses taking this on board. I heard a Danish company representing itself at a meeting we had two weeks ago in Jakarta saying, I'm Grundfos and I'm an SDG 6 company. So, no, I do not produce pumps or I'm in the water business, but I'm an SDG 6 company. And... Nobody says I'm a WTO 14.6 kind of not company. Uh, and I think we need to link that, as was said. And somehow the SDG agenda and the narrative became a narrative of a win-win situation. And suddenly we are at the WTO. It seems to win some, you need, somebody needs to be a loser. And, and I think there's a, there's a mindset uh, around that. And I think we could learn and pick up from, from, from what happened in the SDG process and how that narrative has um, gone, gone, gone viral, gone global. Um, and I, I think there's some, something in there for, for us in terms of business and trade and, and governments. I'll stop at that. Great, thank you. Um, oh, is this, yeah. Aranja, um, so what do you think, we hear a lot about you know, trade needs to more in, be more inclusive, you know, maybe some of these problems are because of a backlash, you know, um, what, liberalization we've seen has seen to be only benefiting a few. What are the practical policy changes do you think that need to be made to change that perception? Well, uh, let me go back to, uh, uh, to your original question, which is uh, what, uh, what's wrong and how do we fix it? And I look at the WTO and I think, okay, let's imagine this is a company. Let's say it's a not-for-profit company so that we don't get things mixed up. And it has 162 shareholders. And what I see in this company is a hyper-legalized company. The legal department has too much power. It's an undercapitalized company. The shareholders are not investing enough capital. It's an atomized company. It's not linking with other parts of the value chain. And we all know that businesses in the 21st century are all about uh, value chain. And it's a company that has entire departments that are just simply not working. So how do we fix this? So if, you know, if, if I was McKinsey, which I'm not, uh, no, we're not. Um, 
this is the diagnosis I would have of this company. So how do we fix this? The first thing I would say is we need to get better shareholders to invest better capital in this company. And this is not just simply done by kicking down the can to uh, their uh, technical officials or you know, sending smart ambassadors to Geneva. This requires investing in this organization, is investing in the company. If you don't invest in the company, the returns are going to be uh, very, very minimalistic. And if you keep kicking the company, you're not going to get results out of this company. So as a good business person, I would tell you, invest political uh, capital in your company. The second thing uh, I would tell you is start creating spaces in this company for dialogue, for debate, for discussion. Don't invite uh, the legal department to those discussions. Keep them out of the room. <laughs> have them in separate rooms. If you don't like it, build a tent in the garden to have those discussions. <laughs> That's a bit what we are trying to do modestly in the area of women and trade. We've put forward a suggestion that 120 countries, sorry, I think it's 122 countries by now, have embraced to exchange best practices as to how does one connect more women to international trade. And we don't want rules. We are not talking about rules. We don't want to segregate women in business with a specific rules and in a specific boxes. All we want is to understand why in some parts of the world only one in five exporters is a woman, whereas in other parts, four in five exporters are women-owned businesses. We want to understand this because, incidentally, if we connect these women to, to markets through international trade, it's going to contribute to better growth in our economy. So the second thing I would recommend very practically is make sure that you create a spaces for debate, for discussion, and I very much like what uh, Susanna said, this is underutilized in the WTO. The third recommendation I would make, if this was a company, you, shareholders don't meet every two years to discuss treaties. Shareholders meet once a year, and they go and look at the agenda of the organization, and I look at what's working and what's not working, and make practical recommendations to make what's not working work better. So don't wait for a big ministerial with big bang every two years. Meet with your shareholders every year and take a very down-to-earth agenda to clean, uh, to clean it. The, the last thing I would do would be to invite these shareholders on a trip every month to see the real world, to see countries, to see businesses, to see small businesses, to see micro, to see refugees that are connecting to international trade, uh, that are connecting to the economy through trade, to see displaced, to see unemployed, I would invite them on a trip to the real world. Because if we connect this, if we reconnect them to what's happening in the real world, maybe we would get a better chance of shaping the organization with what matters for the organization today. Thank you. Okay, so we've, we've heard about two disconnects now, I think. One between Geneva and governments, and now another one between the trade policymakers and the real world. Um, I'm going to hop across to Rufus at this point and ask um, which connection he thinks is missing. Who do you think needs to, to step up and make, make changes? Which shareholder should be doing more? Well, I, I imagine many in the audience have some in mind. Uh, <laughs> I, let, let me, before I go to that, though, let me step back to say, obviously, I'm here on, on behalf of a, you know, a large number of international companies with um, millions of employees globally, something like $4 trillion in sales around the world, uh, wanting to emphasize, you know, the tremendous importance they place on the kind of predictability and stability and global cooperation that an institution like the WTO has represented um, I, you know, I always have to compliment Arancha for a colorful uh, um, presentation comparing it to a company. But, but let's face it, I mean, the WTO is uh, a cooperative effort, but it's also a contractual relationship among a lot of parties with differing interests and objectives who have to find a way forward together. And, you know, that's always going to take effort and time, um, you know, there's a lot of impatience about what the WTO should do right away and how it should change. We're trying to make the transition from, um, you know, an effort that 
ended up in disarray, the Doha round, uh, to try to find a new agenda. That is going to take time. I teach uh, uh, students in a, in a course on trade negotiations, and many of them ask me, what's the best training to be a trade and negotiator? Do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be an economist in political science? I tell them you should study geology because it's the, it's the study of the effect of time and pressure on uh, your natural environment. And if you want to end up with a diamond, you really have to have a lot of time and a lot of pressure. The better the, the, better the time and the effort, uh, the better the jewel. And, you know, I, I'm sure that a lot of people are looking, for example, at my own administration, which I'm having a few uh, family quarrels with uh, internally on some other trade agreements that you may know about. Um, and I listen carefully to Ambassador Lighthizer. I mean, I, I, I tend to take the, the optimistic view about what all this means for the future of the system. First of all, of course, he was pointing out criticisms, but criticisms that, as Arantxa said, can become part of a useful debate and discussion, issues we do have to confront within the system. Uh, the development issue um, and, you know, the status of countries developed versus developing in the system and what that means for the rules. Actually, when you get into cases, you start to find there aren't that many places where obligations of countries are uh, impacted by special and differential treatment. But there is the broader issue of a big country like China, second largest economy in the world, uh, eventually I'm sure to be uh, maybe the first, and the thought that it would claim special and differential treatment would strike uh, money as, as curious. So it, these are debates we have to have. What I would want to, if I want to give an optimistic conclusion to this, I would say, I remember when I was a negotiator in the Uruguay round, um, which took a long time and had a lot of breakdowns, and at many times people predicted that it meant the end of the system. I remember a famous uh, economist at MIT, Lester Thoreau, uh, who made a famous statement, front page of the business section of the New York Times, GATT is dead. And what he was really saying is this is the end of the multilateral system. Uh, well, of course, he was right. GATT was dead. It became the WTO. It became even a bigger, stronger uh, multilateral institution. So where I do agree with, with the Ranch's uh, uh, analogy to a company is it really is about investing uh, real capital in trying to make it work. So part of the answer to the challenge that Ambassador Lighthizer made is it has to be collective, it has to be genuine, and it has to involve everyone, of course, including my own country, uh, in, in facing challenges and what the new agenda is. Very last point. A lot of this has to do with the tremendous changes that are occurring in our societies and in our uh, technological base of our societies and our economy, and recognizing that technological revolution and what it means for trade and trade cooperation is going to be extremely important for the future of the system. Rufus, thank you. Um, next, I would like to ask Isabel. Um, so. To play devil's advocate uh, to those who wring their hands and say that we can't agree anything at this multilateral institution, um, one, of the, one of the solutions is, well, okay, well, countries are going to move forward. They're going to start agreeing plurilateral deals, regional deals, um, even bilateral deals. Um, so maybe it doesn't matter that this thing is clogged because, because people are going to go ahead and then eventually everyone else will have to catch up. Do you have a, a response to that? So first of all, thank you for the question. So I'm new in the UN family, but uh, I'm old in the negotiation in the political life because it's my past in my country, in Belgium, a country uh, where you know that uh, consensus building is something that we know very well, uh, even if we sometimes we, we, we will not succeed. But, uh, well, we are, it's a little bit of second nature for us and also, of course, in the European Parliament. So... Uh, I would like to take another comparison. Of course, we can compare uh, WTO and the problems knowing in WTO as a company. We could also compare it to uh, well, uh, a discussion, a political discussion. And I think I fully agree with the, the chair. Uh, what about the necessity to, to uh, uh, encourage the high level of dialogue? Because I'm completely sure that it's the only way to work on that. To, and in UNCTAD, because I'm now Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, 
uh, in our conference, we, we try and we sometimes we succeed with discussion and dialogue on controversial question in the WTO, but it could be more uh, easily and safely discussed in the conference in Junta because there is no, mm -mm, I mean, uh, threaten what about decision, rules, etc. So I, it's the demonstration that we need more dialogue and more discussion between the different uh, countries uh, in safe places. Second things, I think that uh, uh, there is a life <laughs> after uh, Buenos Aires, that's true for WTO and for other organizations. It was in Bonn, I was in Bonn uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the climate conference, and of course it's not a big success, but it was, it was a step in a long march and it's not so easy. So of course there is a life after that. But I think that uh, uh, we, we could also uh, highlight another disconnection, so you speak about the regional or the bilateral agreement. I think that we have to accept uh, that sometimes, for example, what about food, uh, uh, or agriculture, food sovereignty is not automatically protectionism. And you have to accept also in the WTO that you could have levels uh, of uh, uh, satisfaction of the needs. And first of all, that sovereignty, what about food, could be first of all uh, 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 achieved on the national or regional level. It's not bad to say that. And I think that sometimes international trade, of course, it has to as goal to reduce poverty, but it's not always the case. We, we are conscious that sometimes there are winners, but there are also losers. And especially in the, the poorest in the poor country, there are of course the losers. Uh, and so on that, we have to accept that, to put that also in the discussion. Otherwise, populist movement, uh, anti-globalization movement will continue to uh, uh, highlight that. And if we, if we ignore it, I think that will not help the multilateral systems to, to, to find or to uh, uh, restart with a new, uh, uh, a new start. So I think that accepting that national or regional approach, it's not the bad one. And when we speak about the global value chain, I think that sometimes we have to speak about the regional value chain. And it's, it's important for the smalls and the post uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the international trade to start on the regional trade and help to that. And uh, uh, finally, I think that we have also to work we discussed that yesterday uh, long, uh, during a long meeting about uh, non tariff measure. That's also very important in order to help. And if we could do all those things, probably we will help WTO to, well, restart differently as it, is, uh, it will be the case uh, today or tomorrow, this evening. Great. And, and, and finally, um, Tony, so I guess uh, the repulse to the idea that regional integration regional integration is going to save us all would be that you're going to get fragmentation, you're going to get competing sets of rules, and that's going to you know, undermine the whole idea of having the, the WTO. Uh, what, what would your response to that be? Yeah, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, I think that uh, just going back to what Susanna was mentioning in, his, uh, in her remarks, uh, I think we have to start it's just one, one basic observation that I think was mentioned by Rufus. Some of this fragmentation of the global governance, and I think it goes beyond trade. This is, I think, goes, the, the fragmentation is happening in other areas. It's happening because there are big changes in our structural economy in the last 20, 25 years, and each of us can have our preferred stylized facts and, you know, in the terms of, you know, how the emerging economies are participating more and more in global trade, in global investment, in global value change, in global manufacturing. We can take uh, any stylized facts that we want, but that's, that's the reality. We have a big structural changes that are, I think, uh, 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 having an impact on the global governance, uh, uh, in the architecture of the global governance. And I think that at least there are three areas in which this is happening. One is trade, which is the one that we are more familiar, and I'll go back to your specific question. But other, another one is the financial architecture. I think it's exactly the same thing is happening uh, in the global uh, financial system. Uh, there are a multiplicity and a fragmentation of bodies and institutions and instances of you know, uh, mechanisms for emerging liquid, emer emergency liquidity for financial standards and so on. Development banking is another, and I came from a development bank. Development in general, the implementation of development policies is actually having a, a fragmentation in terms of their institution, in terms of their, the policy. As you know, there are many multi, uh, multiple uh, regional and sub-regional and parallel development banks uh, which are in a way connected to the, to the surf of these uh, SDGs. Uh, 
And I think the third one is this, the, the, the fragmentation in the global, in the global trade uh, architecture. So I think this is, I think, the first fact that I think we have to, to recognize is that there are underlying uh, structural causes to explain that, and I think we have to understand why they are. The fragment much more concrete of what we mean about this uh, uh, compatibility between the systems. And I was having breakfast this morning, I think about what I will say that is interesting for uh, an audience that you know, we all uh, meet many, many times. And I thought about, you know, let's think about three eyes in which I think we should be focusing our efforts. One, and I think it's very linked to what uh, Susanna was saying at the, at the beginning, interdependence, I think is a key word, interdependence between these different systems, the financial architecture, the development architecture, and the trade architecture, just to put the three most important ones. I think we have to have ways in which these agendas uh, talk to each other, and I think was the call that uh, Susanna was mentioning. You know, all the SDGs, uh, there are several SDGs goals that are very important for, not for the I mean, traditional emerging economies, but for middle income type of economies. You know, we talk about resilient infrastructure, we talk about sustainable cities, we talk about managing climate change, things that are related to a, a very different levels of uh, development. So we need to understand what our financial instruments, what our development instruments, what our trade instruments can do for, for that. The second, and I think maybe the most important one for me that deals a lot with the regional issues and regional integration, is, uh, and I, I, you know, I use a word that we use all in, in, uh, in, in trade facilitation, kind of a sense of interoperability. The, the systems have to, to connect, have to uh, communicate between uh, each other. You know, what we do in a regional agreement has to, in a way, have an impact, has to be taken from the multilateral system. And the same way the, the reverse is, is true. I mean, we, we cannot just uh, have, uh, you know, RTAs for many, many years, uh, regional trade agreements, were an exception and still are an exception to the system. They cannot be an exception anymore, as is part of the system. So the, this, this system, the multilateral and the regional, have to have uh, very clear uh, channels of engagement, channels of uh, impact. And the last, and I'm going to finish with this, the, uh, the last I, is impact. I think we have to measure the way we do things regionally or multilaterally by the impact that they have. In development, we measure this in terms of dollars. You know, when we do a project, we want to measure what is actually happening. When we create a trade rule or when we do a, a financial standard, we want to know what's going to happen, what's going to be the economic impact. So we have to have monitoring, we have to have measurement uh, to be accountable for what we actually decide. I'll leave it like this. Wonderful. Okay, we're, we're running short on time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one question from the audience, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to essentially come up with a one, one sentence or one thought that you, you wish that all of those participants over there in the Hilton would agree on. <laughs> uh, so, you know, your plea, your plea to them. Um, so prepare, prepare that snappy statement. Um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, this mic's just coming. Carlos Primo Braga, Fundação Dom Cabral Brasil, IMD Switzerland. I'm amazed to see a panel that goes for one hour and a half, very interesting insights, but one word, or actually two words, were not mentioned, Donald Trump. So uh, my question is mainly to Rufus and Arancha, but to all the panelists. Do you think this time is different? Or we are just have to have the patience of geologists. Nice, nice easy question. Rufus. <laughs> um, making, making an obvious question that hasn't really been addressed. Look, it clearly is a challenging time. I am doing everything I can to urge people in my own administration to recognize the importance, the increased importance of us trying to address future challenges through cooperation rather than confrontation. I do not believe that economic nationalism is a viable way for us to cope with the future we all face. You know, this technological revolution and the changes it is producing, it's not just that people are uh, losing jobs to trade. That's, you know, trade has created 
more jobs than it's destroyed. There are adjustments. But clearly, we're going through a huge revolution and change that a lot of people either fear or don't necessarily know what their future livelihood is going to be. And that's created uh, political pressures all over the world, not just in the United States. The difference with the United States is we have been a leader in the system for decades. We've convinced, and, and I certainly was part of that process, convincing the rest of the world that the rules mattered and that uh, the system matters. Um, and if there's a perception that we're turning our back on it, uh, that's not going to inure to our benefit and it's not going to solve the problem. Um, I hope, and I want to be optimistic about it, I think that a lot of what Ambassador Lighthizer was engaging in here, because he did talk about the fact that the system was important to us. He's raising criticisms, he's raising challenges, but it's also, to me, was not a walk away moment. It was a moment of engagement and how we now uh, help move that in the right direction is a collective, uh, collective effort. Arantxa, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, what I, what I, um, what I always say is that I agree with uh, Donald Trump's diagnosis. I have a profound agreement with him on the fact that there are many people that are not benefiting uh, today. Uh, they are not being lifted by the economy. And there is too many people in some places in, in uh, many countries, this is very localized. Uh, this is creating anger. This is creating resentment against the system. This is creating uh, a backlash in which trade uh, is being captured uh, by the huge structural transformation that our economies, our societies, not just our economies, uh, I would urge us to look also at the social aspects uh, of this change that we are totally underestimating as opposed to the economic uh, side of the challenges, but where I have a profound disagreement with Donald Trump is in what is the recipe to fix this. And I think the recipe to fix this is not, is, is must be to invest in people, and this means education, and this means healthcare, and this means infrastructures, and this means digital connectivity, and this means retraining, retooling, reskilling, and then this means more international cooperation. So I fundamentally agree with the problem, I fundamentally disagree with the solution. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are right out of time. So very quickly, um, what is your plea, Suzanne? I have to go first? Yeah. No, <laughs> the plea? No, um, I've, I've been over there so um, for the last few days. So um, I think what we would love to see is a, lo a lot more commitment uh, to a fundamental uh, institution that we would really like to see preserved, but definitely developing in, in light of also the comments we've seen here today. Great. Rancha? So with the old Twitter handle, I would have said make trade great again, but with the new Twitter <laughs> handle, which allows you for more characters, I would say isolationism is for losers, multilateralism is for the smart, choose your company. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Tony? Yeah, I think given the, the challenging times that we are in, I think we shouldn't forget where we are, and this is not a, a, a usual conference. I think I'll, I'll agree with, you know, with Rufus. We have to keep the, the institution uh, alive. This is still very important. I think we shouldn't forget that this is a challenge at times for the, for the WTO. Uh, it's the cornerstone of the, of, the, of the system. It has to be, as Susanna was said, connected to other challenges, to other goals. It cannot be disconnected. And it has to be an open institution. I think it's great that we're having this forum here, that in the, across the street they're having the business forum uh, talking about these issues. Uh, so that's, I think, is what we should keep uh, alive and, and, and going. Great. So um, I think that uh, never a reform of WTO could replace uh, commitment. And I think that it's on commitment that we have to work. Uh, it means through dialogue, etc., to battling between regional and different levels in order to, uh, to work well. And secondly, I think that uh, one other word was not uh, uh, used uh, to, today in this debate is the civil society. What means civil society? It's, I think that it's important to keep on board all the losers, uh, all the people, uh, and I think that uh, even the people we, we, who disagree with the international trade are not lost 
for the trait. They are maybe lost for a, a, a certain trust, a certain trait, but not for all the trade uh, activities. So on that, I think that we have to work. There was a business forum, but there was also a civil society forum, and work and listen to the civil society in order to also Im implement and uh, uh, put in the debate the question of the civil society. It's also what about social uh, approach, what said uh, Arancha, it's very important to keep the people on board. Rufus. So, uh, before I go to my one sentence, uh, I just to say I, I, I basically agree with what Arantxa said about what the real underlying problems that we face, that all societies face with, with going forward to adjust to this new age, uh, and that if we make trade the scapegoat, we're doing the wrong thing. But to get to my one sentence, of course the WTO will still have to deal with the issues that it's dealt with all along. I hesitate to call it the traditional economy, but many of the issues of agriculture and manufacturing and other things that it's dealt with for a long time. But I think to recognize that it won't be able to do that without fully taking on board the need to have an agenda for the new age, for the new technologies, for the transformations those technologies are going to bring about. And by the way, tremendous opportunities for those technologies to be great democratizing elements and uh, inclusive, um, uh, 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 shall we say, creating greater inclusiveness because they have the, the capability to make uh, many, many more uh, people around the world participants in the trading system and beneficiaries of it rather than losers from it. And mine would be stay enthusiastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.